scroll of the... Are you familiar with this thing, with the wheel? Have you seen this before? This stands for window icon menu and pointer. So it still remains this desk. So that is why it's, that's why it's important. So um, in this methodology that they used to build this graphical user interface, they they came up with five main principles. And this was the second question of your coursework. Can anybody tell me which five principles this were? This one? Yeah. yeah. Uh, familiar conceptual model. And what does it mean? Uh, like some that's like a metaphor of the desktop and uh, folders and uh, yep. the fresh and stuff. Any other one? Simplicity. Yeah. What does it mean? <laughs> but is it good to keep it very simple? No. Obviously, where we have one specific graphic layout, it will make two different ways. You will use the that's the key thing. You don't know, have well, just one for one user. You have several types of users with different types of skill preferences. <coughs> and this comes to another uh, principle, which is tolerability. So not only has the interface to adapt to the user preferences automatically, but the user has to have the capacity to do it manually or by um, to, the, to the menu. I think I'm missing another one. Yeah, what's this one else? Consistency. Consistency. What does it mean? Make sure everything works in a similar way. The device, Crane, a set of paradigms that all software actions are based on. You can retrieve all creation, copy and you know. Yeah, that's related with another one, which is um, universal command, which is consistency in the commands. Well, there's another one which is consistency in the interface, which is keep it, keep all the elements. That's so the way. Yes, and then we've got reinforcing people's understanding of how things work, like if they click something in one kind of application that does main types of things, they continue that, and it works as in the That fosters vulnerability. Um, Admits the expectations of the users to how the operating systems and all the applications that you can find. Uh, this can, you know, the, the thing about this is that it looks like, oh, this is for granted, you know, yeah, it should be consistent, we should have scroll bars, but in those days it wasn't that, that, wasn't that obvious. So that's why it was that amazing at the time. Uh, and still these days you can find websites that are not consistent. And the menus are not repeated through the whole website, so it's a little bit confusing and people get lost. Um, and so on. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've done this. We came up with the principles. And we answered to the first two questions. Uh, let's go directly to the fourth one. Let's just give the third one. So, as it was from break, and they came up with these five principles. In this lecture, in this in this course unit, we have like ten main principles for efficient design. A trick you can have to memorize these things is that the five principles of the um, Xerox stuff are in these ten principles. So we have simplicity, durability, um, universal commands, consistency, and familiar concepts. So there are some five more or six more um, principles that make the ten principles of uh, efficient use you saw last, last week. So I, I must admit I have my <coughs> cheat sheet here. So, um, can anybody tell me what um, situational awareness is? somebody operating you know in a traffic control interface or in an airport or in a nuclear plant they have lots of stimuli lots of 
with tons lots of screens. So the interface has to provide them with enough information to know what they are doing, what they should do next. Um, it's quite similar to this situation awareness, but it's not quite the same. What's self-description? That's self Yes. And how do you manage to do that? Well, I guess kind of comes with the other bits of but like using kind of sensible indications of what things do and uh, like say you use a bit of things, there's always like feedback so you don't wonder whether you fit in. Yes, yeah, that's the point. That's affordances. You don't have to remember this word, affordances. You can also the button has to look like a button, and if you click a button, you have to have feedback of pushing it and coming backwards. That's the affordance that thing. Um, what about scalability? Anybody? Take the data. If it goes for small set of data, you should go for large set of data as well. Yeah. So you can understand how it works. Yes. As it happens that in the development process, uh, designers just have application with not much data, but when they you know, would deploy it massively, they come up with problems like, oh, we have too many data and it doesn't scale, and you know, the industry starts to be cluttered and too open So, you have to foresee that this thing, that this um, event can, can happen. I have another one that's learnability, but this happens, I mean, learnability shows up in across all the principles and dimensions. So uh, I think that if we use familiar concepts, universal commands, if we are consistent, this all fosters learnability. And it's one of the key um, dimensions or principles we have to keep in mind when we, when we see this. Um, and there are a couple more, like stability and progressive disclosure, but yeah, more or less they are. So let's go to the third question. What does GOMS stand for and what does it involve? What does GOMS mean? Goals, operators, methods, and selection rules. Yeah, what's that? Uh, well, the goals of like, what you're intending to accomplish, the operators of the actions that you perform, and methods like the sequences of actions. And this is the which choice to use it. Yes. But what, I mean, yeah, you, you, you described very well what the GOMS is. What, what's GOMS? Uh, why you need that? To develop a, a framework for kind of understanding um, how successful people are going to be able to. Framework is a model, so you can model user behavior. And why we want to model user behavior? What's the purpose of this? As a uh, interface designer or so many years, why we want to do this? I'm trying to understand the processes that a user is going to undergo in, in completing a task. So you want to model that to see if you know, that's what you're trying to model. Yeah, you want to know whether they make mistakes or whether your interface is not good enough. <coughs> yeah, right. Um, so, and this comes is a model. So, what are the good things of having models? Why we need a model? To, to predict user behavior. Why? It gives you guidelines like how, on how to design the system. Yeah, that's related with his answer, but <coughs> why is it so difficult to model human behavior? Because <coughs> they're not predictable. That's the point. Why? Why are they unpredictable? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, because they're human, it's a circular time. There are so many variables involved. So you build the model so that you limit the amount of variables. And by doing this, you are able to explain some phenomenon in a high level of certainty. So you, you, you have a very narrow view of something, but you are very sure about that if you use a model. That's the thing, that's the point of using models. Um, when you go into companies in your future, I mean, I don't think you will use GOMS this much as long as you are not in research department or so. But it's good to have in mind, in mind. Because 
if you are involved in research or want to read further, it's something that shows very often. <coughs> right. So the lecture of today is principles of engaging experience. Um, before we start with engaging experience, it's good to, to set the context of what we've done so far to see what we are doing. So you've seen the, the principles of um, effective experience. Do I remember this five words? Oof. Is it a period? Yeah, it would be like that. Yes. So it's you have to keep openness, you have to make sure that the interface is receivable, it has to be operable, understandable, and extensible. So that you can provide access in as much a situation as possible to different people with different skills, with different devices in a wide diverse situations. So last week we saw the principles for efficient experience, three principles that we have to do now. Um, this is about providing access. This is about Say, providing proper access. And there's another one, which are principle of, principles of affective experience. These principles are going to be seen next week in the next lecture. And they describe how the aesthetics or the complexity of the interface influence on the interactions of the user. It has also a big component of emotional design. Emotional design. But this is something for next week. So you guys as future UX experts will have to keep in mind all these three dimensions with its respective principles. However there's this thing called engaging experience, which I understand is like an add-on to to these three dimensions. Um, I mean it's hard because um, we don't know if it should be applied or not. Uh, we don't know if it ensures a better user experience because we don't have solid foundations to assure that. Um, but it's very trendy and it's been massively used in the last years in the software engineering domain. So, this is how Simon goes. It's like digital umami intercepting my issues. So, you know what umami is? It's like additional flavor apart from sweet, sour, salt, and bitter. And it means in Japanese, I think, deliciousness. So, it's like the icing on top of the cake. You, know, you can't have the cake without the icing. And having this icing makes it better. But too much icing is too much. <laughs> you know, it's too tasty. So what I mean by this is that you have to be careful on how to provide the right engagement. And this umami thing has three dimensions that overlap. So if we want to provide an engaging experience, we will have to know the principles of phonology, social dynamics, and gamification. Right? So you've heard this word before, gamification. Yeah. So as you might know, there are Lots of people in favor of the gamification. Right? Gamification is amazing, you know, it's the best next thing. We should forget about everything we learned so far and let's do everything through games because games are great. So, the people who oppose this view think that um, 
gamification may be so rapid, but they are trying to put it everywhere. They are forcing gamification in places where it should be, shouldn't be uh, used. Um, so there's people thinking that this is some business um, indications behind using this uh, gamification. While people in favor of Umami, I think they don't have a solid argument. They say, oh yeah, there might be some bad examples of gamification, but still, you can apply it in several scenarios. So what is it? So gamification takes advantage of, um, of let's say, humans are predetermined to, to be engaged, to adopt things through games. So we like games. <coughs> And if we um, employ games as a mechanism to, to achieve tasks, computerized tasks, um, some say that the experience will be better. I will see some examples. So in the end, it's like um, using the mechanisms of games, video games, into applications, into forms and web applications. Right, so one of the first dimensions of engagement is social dynamics. There's technology and there's gamification, we will see later on. Um, so, what does this mean? It means that we humans, we are social animals. And we feel better if we belong to a group. We perform better if we do it group wise. And these principles apply across uh, many, many domains and also into working with computers. Even if you don't believe <laughs> this is true. Um, so if we want to facilitate this, this strength of, of the group and this this feeling of belonging to a group into computers. Uh, one of the things you have to keep in mind is that um, you have to provide an interface that makes it easy to facilitate social interactions with your peers through a more humanistic, naturalistic conversation. So, what's <laughs> the thing that comes to your mind when you come up with this word, this social interaction? Which sort of platform, application, web page, website comes to your mind. Yes. Having, for example, reviews on Amazon? Yes. Are you looking for something more explicit? Yes, for instance. Right. Yes. So that's, uh, I would say, a too explicit example of a social dynamics. It's like if somebody says, OK, let's develop an application which is just social dynamics. So people who develop um, social network. But that's too obvious because the bonding between people and the relationships between people are very evident. You make friends with somebody else. And these relationships are quite stable through time. And looking for something more subtle. You know, you have a website, and maybe the example of Amazon or eBay is more appropriate. So um, how we manage to, to, to put this social interaction in a more subtle way, you know, like maybe like um, if you have a, you know, an online shop and we want people to interact with it and, and have a feeling of being a member of the community, you can uh, facilitate some, some forum or some um, community so that people feel attached to the product or to the, to the website. You don't need to build uh, if you are um, selling shoes online, you don't need to, to build a social network for the guys that like uh, these shoes. You know? But you have to facilitate these dynamics. You have to make sure that people are able to engage and to participate to this thing. And make them feel like they are part of, of something. Because in this way, they will feel better, they will like experience much, um, and they will perform. So how we can also facilitate uh, social dynamics? 
So it says energy that is often found in human interaction. I don't like this energy thing because it's like tangent. But I would say it's like we have to take advantage of the knowledge we <coughs> have of our workforce to put it into applications. So you can make you can facilitate to have um, you know this this term. Computer supported collaborative work. So it's a subdiscipline within human computer interaction, interaction that does research into how people collaborate, work together, and what the infrastructure and software and the social networking that is behind all these processes. So uh, if you build a product where people work together, um, see the outcomes of their work together. This will enhance, for sure, the social dynamics. So, can you think about some web application or some app where this knowledge is put together? And people can work together collaboratively. Any Sorry? Sorry? Sorry. 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 When you are learning a language online, they always have you assess somebody else to do it and give them feedback. On it. And that can actually, and then you see what they're doing and see what you're doing. So you have like some somebody who has the role of the master and the one. Somebody who speaks the language through it, they will assess the work that you've done as a second language and tell you what mistakes you made or whatever. Yes. Well, yeah. Then you connect with them and you can see what they're learning and they can see you sort of like link it together, don't you? Yes. Basically, so you like Another example where people that take part are in a, have the same role, there's not a master and somebody below. That's a good one. Yeah. You can edit the document between a high number of people. Edit, cross paste, you know, do all this work. So, uh, yes, I mean, this, this, this makes, this facilitates social dynamics and people tend to write it. Next one. Proper lasting to have a better user experience because they are closer to our expectations of person to person interactions. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is related to what is expected from us in the real life. Uh, how this transforms into applications or into web applications. So I think it's quite tricky, but I would say that in for instance Foursquare, we keep on going to places in our physical real life. Um, Foursquare like, just imitates or just it's a reflection of what we do in our real life. So okay, I checked in, in this uh, place. Uh, I'm not sure whether initially there was some business idea we found behind uh, Foursquare, but like everything, we can have a business case. Also, how we can facilitate social dynamics by feeling more secure and more likely to perform better with groups. That we talked about this before. Uh, by taking advantage of expectations or performance to social and cultural norms. An example of the last, last sentence is, for instance, I get my British gas bill every three months and I can access to it online. So in addition to telling me that I have to pay a high amount of money, it tells me whether I want to see how my neighbors consume electricity. Um, in this way, I can see how the group I belong to, that is my neighbor, how they consume, what are their habits, whether I consume more or less than they do. And this allows you to modulate your consume, not because you want to save energy or to save money, it's because you want to adjust to what your group does. Okay. Uh, this is a, a tablet back in 2008, it's a Microsoft Courier. Does anybody know it? Aspects, yeah. What do you know about, about it? I mean, it's a prototype. Yes. I need to kill the screen. 
dual screen book, just mimicking a real life netbook. Yep. So yeah, it was the prototype in Microsoft Research in, in Seattle. Um, after two years, it was, it was cancelled. But the heart, the foundations of this tablet were to propitiate social dynamics. So, if you and me had this tablet, I could send you a file just by drag and dropping it to you. Or we could work collaboratively with, like if we do this days with Google Docs, and so on. Uh, but they cancelled this prototype. That doesn't mean that the energy and all the knowledge involved in this product was lost. Because in parallel, Microsoft Research was developing the, the old surface. Now we have, we have the Microsoft Surface, you know, this computer that is you know, quite a person and everything. But do you know what the old surface is? The large, large screen where you could interact and do lots of social dynamics. So I found a video, it's quite interesting for those that haven't seen it. The Samsung SUR40 with Microsoft Pixel Sense brings people together. Making it possible to collaborate as never before. Technology that's innovative and incredibly useful at the same time. An experience that's not just changing the landscape, but creating an entirely new one. With Microsoft Pixel Sense, the Samsung SUR40 sees and responds to touch and objects enabling unprecedented interaction. The Samsung SUR40 is a powerful solution for your business. It draws people in, informs, educates, and builds connections. People love the experience of the SUR40 because it's easy to use, natural, intuitive. And it's the perfect size for people to interact and share information in completely new ways. The thin, elegant profile this stunning 40-inch high-definition multi-touch screen opens the door to new opportunities. The Samsung SUR40 with Microsoft Pixel Sense simplifies interaction in a natural way. Breaking down barriers and bringing people together to connect, learn, and decide using everyday objects. It seamlessly merges the physical and digital worlds and the possibilities Samsung SUR40 with Microsoft Pixel Sense. So, has anybody of you used it before? Have any experience with it? So, I used it like two years ago. I mean, the, the big surface thing. And it's quite amazing, it's quite impressive, the thing. And they say that it's easy, it's intuitive. Uh, it's easy when you learn how to use it, but the thing is that it has so many possibilities, it has so many options. You can do anything. Any touch meant anything, you know, meant something. I mean, you could propagate the command without knowing what you were doing. So, I mean, I've saw some demo of um, people operating with somebody remotely in the hospital through this uh, screen. It's quite, quite impressive. Yeah. Not sure to what extent it's intuitive or easy to use. It has too many possibilities. So I would have restricted and constrained the whole thing. Right. So this is an ATM, a crash machine that uses jargon. Uh, it's using English copy instead of proper English. So, uh, this facilitates social dynamics. But why, why do you think that this facil facilitates social dynamics? It's using a local <laughs> but why, if you are a Kongi speaker, how do you feel about it? Yes? You feel like you're a member of some, some group that um, 
bank machine, the bank itself is close to you. It's a way of creating bonds between consumers and, and companies. Um, but I see some, I can see some advantages about this, you know. I mean, if you stick down in your area, you have this sort of machine. Oh, right. I mean, I will draw money in this, in this bank. But what are the disadvantages of this? That's the point. Uh, what if you still understand this, but you are in a hurry, or you are not in the mood of having fun? Just what's happening? I mean, it's nice. Yeah, I mean, this plays with the uh, unexpected things, but once it is expected, it's not fun anymore. Not for me. It's okay. It's alright. It's very personal. You might like it. You have another opinion. Good research, you know. Saturday evening, you need cash very fast and it has some this jargon that stops you from doing it properly. Right, so the next dimension is is to know. While social dynamics, and as we will see next, gamification, have some strong foundations in science, um, not sorry in science, but have been widely used, uh, phonology has more of an academic background and has not been very widely used. Um, there are some, <coughs> some concepts that if you do a comprehensive literature review of phonology, you will come up with which are the following. Mm, I would say it's a long list of items. But according to the academic work of phonology, if you personalize the interface, uh, you make it more fun. So for instance, it says, don't think labels, think expressiveness and identity. This is quite related with what do you remember Simon last week talking about the white cords of the iPod? That this is a note that indicates that you are attached to a brand and you are an iPod user and that well, you are cool. So <laughs> identity is important, but it can happen with Apple products or people fighting, you know, I am, a, I am a Microsoft person, I am an Apple person, and your MP3 player is rubbish. You know, people like to be attached to things and they think that that's don't think about it. They feel it's more fun. You have to provide <coughs> room for intangibles. Uh, don't think ease of use, think enjoyment of experience. Oh, there is some problem with this. I mean, if you want to provide enjoyment, you have to do it in a tangible way. Some things are not very precise here. Because the next principle is tangible. So don't hide, don't represent, show. What's the problem with this no don't represent with the principles we've seen in the previous lectures? This is some, some contradiction with what you have learned so far. Don't represent, why not? What's the problem? Because that, well, if you're representing something, you're using a metaphor for something. Yes. So you, you know, you don't be saying don't be sad and that yes. Narrative. Possibilities to create one's own story or ritual. I think it's more related to what you will see next week with affective experience, <coughs> with the flow. I mean, how you interact with uh, an application and you, you know, you're in the flow and you forget about everything but just the interaction and you keep very engaged with that. Um, Metaphor. Metaphor does not suck. Uh, yeah, use metaphors. Communal and learning. So give social opportunities, as we've seen before, with the social dynamics. Give room so that people can communicate, can show that they belong to a determined group, to, that they like some product, they are attached to this product. Make this happen. And again, the ubiquitous term of learning, learning, learning. Make it consistent so that a learning experience can happen. 
Right, this is one example of how you make use of phonology. I mean, these principles are concepts, are many of them. But I will summarize just in how you make one into one fun is by using proper terminology, icons, pictures, but not more. So it should be something very subtle to put in the interface. Like this example. It says there are thousands in the big file in Dropbox. And it's it would take a long time, so they tend to have sneakers. <laughs> this is one maybe for the first time, but the second time, the first time is like, okay. <laughs> Not much fun. Uh, you have to realize and notice that these labels, I mean, pave the way also to use this as advertisements. So while you are downloading a big file or while you are doing a long process, you can have prompts to do this. It's like a uh, handbrake. I think this is a you know this software? Yeah. yeah. What's this? What's mm -hmm. you really this Sorry? You really need this uh, so I assume that it takes a long time to do some processes. Uh, yeah. So is that similar to the Dropbox thing? So they tell you, yeah, put down that cocktail. Yeah. How, as software engineers and user experience experts, how would you improve this, this thing? I'd have more than one show for the work, so I'd like a random number generator. Yes. Between the same amount of numbers and then randomly generate a show for the Yeah. And this is again the company thing, the company thing in my hand. This is the category thing, thing, and then press enter to continue. You may have noticed I'm not an English native speaker, but if I come across this thing, I don't understand this. <laughs> no clue at all. Right, so gamification. Uh, so as I said before, gamification is using the mechanics of games, video games, into web applications, into interfaces, into industrial machinery. So what are the elements that come to your mind that belong to the video game world that you could put into, into interfaces? Yes? Leveling up. Anything else? Points. Points? Or? There are lots of them. Come on. Levels. Yes. High score tables. Yes, it's tables. Another one. Achievements. Achievements. Very well. Anything else? <laughs> Rewards. Mm -hmm. Challenge. Anything else? <coughs> Engagement. Competition. Sorry. Competition. Yes. Competition. Fostering competition between people so that you can have these tables. Let me see. So there are three levels where you can put gamification into interfaces. And it's the elementary level, the Bolton level and the ground up level. The elementary level to me it has a big overlap with technology. It's about being subtle, about the technology, about the labels, about how you say things. That is the way to gamification. There's another one which is more widely used, which is the Bolton. So we have a product, we have a web application, we have an interface. Um, we see opportunities so that we can put elements of games, like uh, leading tables, for instance, if you purchasing a determined e-commerce site, you can have the list of the people that buy more products or the list of the people that make more comments in Amazon, for instance. So, in, in a sense, if you are on the leading table, it gives you a sort of a reward that encourages you to keep on doing things, to keep on feeding the website and keeping it alive. I mean, there wouldn't be no Amazon if people don't make comments will be an empty space of items. <coughs> and this happens with all these social networks, with films, IMDb, uh, 
everything. So it's a way so that people can engage into website building. So it says uh, we can use elements of progress and reward, leaderboards, goals, stages and levels, percentage complete. So how would you, by using one of the, some of these elements, how would you gamify a process of several forms you have to fill out before purchasing something or doing some paper? How would you do? How would you gamify that? Any idea? This is quite open, so feel free to. Yeah. You could give like encouragement like, as you're going through this form. So you've got like, I don't know, um, 20 fields to fill in or something. You could say, for each thing you fill in, it's like, great, nearly there, keep going. You've got a percentage of how far you yeah. are. I don't know. You are doing yeah, the exactly. elementary level of gamification by you know, these subtle prompts, these terms, these items, these things you have to give in. But how would you make use of? Maybe the report not that stages, levels, percentage complete. I mean, all these processes that require several steps can be coming from, I would say. You know, it's nice, you are almost finished, come on, go. Uh, yeah, and there's then the last one. It's like the hardcore gamification, it's ground up. You, know, you cannot distinguish between the application and the video. So it's developed from the very beginning and it's you know developed a video game and they think that how we can speed up processes in filling out forms for the students who are tasks like video. I'm not very convinced about this ground up level. So I have some examples I want to show you. I want you to give me your opinion. I'm sure you know <clears throat> so you know this one. Thing that day. 
which accounted for 1,500 million hours of work, which was a waste of time and money for, for companies, but that's for Google. You can find that on, on Google, <laughs> information about what were the implications of using this. Uh, this is quite recent. You've seen this? I think it's quite large. <laughs> so there's matching between animals and there's a cartoon after that. <laughs> That day I kept on pushing the button and I still don't understand very well what this means. Does anyone know what this is? What this is? So maybe now we are talking about this, you know, we are talking about Google and that's something we want. Something happens first. So three levels, elementary, bottom, ground up, each of which you know, adds more or less calification, it's more or less explicit, more or less subtle. Uh, this is Simon's universe, so I don't understand what this is. Uh, anybody any clue about this? What does this mean? What is the relationship of this with gamification? Anybody familiar with this thinkgeek.com? Geek is the wall to do it. Which makes the information. Uh -huh. It says if you do this, we'll enter into a draw. Uh huh. Um, All right. But what's the thing? It's a, it's a shop. Oh, shop. Yeah. Yeah, this is also part of Simon's universe, but I can tell you something about this. So, gamification is good um, to harvest information about your, your users. Uh, I think it's happened to you very often. You, know, you go to websites and you get um, the first thing they tell you. Well, do you want to fill out this cool uh, form? You know, want uh, to know something about you? Please fill out this service. No way. <laughs> no. But if you gamify it and you put a cartoon or you make some references to popular culture, maybe you are encouraged to do so and you are providing information in a way that for you is not. Uh, this is another example of gamification. See, this is a Boeing web page. So I think last year you could play with the airplanes and do some flying simulation stuff. Not this year. I wasn't able to find an example of this. So, yeah, viewpoints. So now we have a break of 10 minutes. You should be back at. 10 past 12. Uh, meanwhile, I would like you to think about what are your views for gamification, what are your experiences with gamification, if you have developed anything that was gamified, I'm talking about the development process. So think about that and then we will discuss that. Ten past, right?
No, because I got um, past meal after that. So um, it's a red hot one today in that sense. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, California. 
I just want to go sunny, 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 sunny. I really want to do that. Like but, like, but I don't know what my grades are going to be. I don't really want to. Yeah. Yeah. I can't afford to go over there. I can go over there. I can go <laughs> so they put you in a place to live? I'm sure they should have. Yeah. They say a lot of people go there. I mean, there's some crazy people. I'm sure they should have. I'd like to I'm going to give it a go. What, going to the States? It's amazing. It's great. I literally, I know what I'd go to. Oh, cool. It's 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 It's cool. 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 Oh my god. 
maybe too many years out of putting off. Uh -huh. Do you have any good examples of gamification? Good examples. Um, specific in on the Steam games so or like, ah, yeah. yeah, the Steam games they approach you to like uh, to play the game more thoroughly and like have the the games that we we play on the yeah. Um what well, bad ones? Uh bad ones is probably EA games and Battlefield. It's a fire, like, it's a fire from games as well, like, um, I think just because there's so many achievements that you can earn, yeah. which will probably start and it will take like, a few years to complete all. So, is any gamification, because this Steam is a platform yeah. to share video games, so is any gamification mechanism outside the video I mean, inside the platform? It's all, it's all, it's all games on the gamification platform. In your experience? Um, so a lot of forums, if you get to a certain amount of posts, you get an increasing amount of rank. So for example, when you join up, you'll be a, a newbie member, something like that. And when you get to 100 posts, you'll be like a veteran member or something like that. And then it's essentially leveling up through you posting more, which encourages you to post more and face the forum grow. And yeah. Is that encouraging or discouraging? Because it you want to be a member of good standing, and you've seen most members are like, wow. Yes. It's encouraging because if you enjoy the talk, it's something better than you. And you, you style, and you, you know, the, the first level will probably be like 10 posts, and you go to that first level, and you're like, all right. When you look around, you see people that are on like 9,000 posts, you'd be like, that's quite cool. I want to get to 100 and be the next level, like that is. Yeah. I think it does encourage people to post more, definitely. It's pretty I read somewhere that like, um, people, like, a lot of software engineers and mixers spending like more time trying to up their rank on Stack Overflow than actually doing their job. A lot of different elements on that side of the world. You know, you get a bit of like, you start balancing some of the things from the So, is there any good implication for members of Stack Overflow? Oh, yes, it. it I mean, professionally, also, not only well, I mean, for fun, but for Stack Overflow. Yeah. For the people contributing the help, but it's good for the people who like the actual website. More content is more out. Yes. <laughs> I have heard like, a lot of jobs where they like, send us your, they often you, they say, like, send your kit up and I'll like, see you. Uh huh. And then um, some people say, like, the same for Stack Overflow. Really? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah definitely. Is that very common? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I should put my profile there. I think notification feels a certain type of mindset. Some yeah. people really are receptive to getting together. Yes. But my next question no. is related with that. Are you a gamer? Well, I am, but I don't play games for achievements. I just play uh -huh. them because I enjoy them. I don't, I'm not like, I don't need levels and all that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think um, now that I know what your vision is, it suddenly makes sense. And I think a very, uh, in my opinion, a great example of implementing gamification into an app. It's an app called Waze. Um, it's a new uh, global positioning um, app um, on iOS and Android, uh -huh. which is taking customers from TomTom. -tom. And it's, it's just great. It takes all these uh, ideas that you mentioned yeah. to the extreme. It's implemented into the core development of the application. So you get badges for driving through a specific place where you know mapping is not uh, complete in that area. You get the status, you get levels, you can collaborate with other people. Yeah, it makes it a very, very good example. What's the benefit for the for the company for the application? Uh, it it starts to gradually uh, build a complete mapping based on user data. So instead of um, you know paying thousands oh, of satellite companies, people map. So so you generate maps as you drive something like that. Exactly, and you can actually see that it's black content, but it's open source, it's cloud source. Uh -huh. Wow. I was just going to say, um, another example of game patients and how to pull up and some of these run. Uh -huh. so it's quite a lot of map. It basically it's, it's a training app to do runs, but instead of you just plugging music in and going for a run, it has a storyline of you training to be a zombie survivor. So you'll we'll be running away from zombies at points. And literally, it's just a soundtrack that they do with your music. Yes. But like, at one point, you talk to zombies behind you, so you're spring. And then it's just keeps the vibe, it is patient because you, you want to get away from the zombies. <laughs> but you guys laugh, but you've used that. Have you used that? Once. Once. Yeah. Once. Yeah. 
How many times? <laughs> it's just once. Yeah, it's funny once. Yes, that's the thing. I mean, it's once. Well, once you have high run and have high run. Yes. There is a score line high points in the medals and zombie heads. I think, in my case, the reason I suppose in my view is that yeah it's no surprise this they, they play with this surprise effect and these unexpected things like wow this is amazing. Yeah, this is you feel sympathetic to the, you know like the, the Dropbox thing like graph the sneakers it's, like, okay. it's fun but I think that after the first use it's not fun anymore I mean, it's, that's my point but it can change from context from applications and from ways that you deploy the gamifications. Yes? Um, I'm thinking of the training apps and like all the applications that help you compare your like run times with your friends and, and things like that. Maybe gamification and these kinds of things might have a negative effects as well. Like say when you're just not as good as everyone else and uh -huh. you're constantly like at the end of the ranking yes. tables. So you know, just stop using the application. Yes. That's a good point. Depending on how you are, how your mindset is, you might feel encouraged to do more, or to directly you give up. You know, I don't want to take part in this because I'm in French. So <laughs> I want my friends to see that I'm. Any other experience with gamification? So that's one's highly unusual. That's highly massive in English. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's one that wasn't exactly cute. Um, I used to work at a supermarket part time, and they had a thing where every department chose a product. Whichever department increased their product sales by the most percentage won, like, I think it was like a really small prize. But obviously, certain people on every department were really pushing their products, and I guess that's going to be you want your department to win. Not because the prize is good, because the prize is atrocious, but because you want your department to win. Yeah, we want to show off because yeah, yeah. yeah. Isn't that something? Uh, is there something in like America where they have like um, employee of the year? Yes. Uh, in here, but, like, yes. I think you get the thickness of that. You can have it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, do you think that's good or that's bad? It's the consequences of fostering this competition between people, employees, or departments. It's very good for business because it increases sales of, because it tries to go for the products. For example, I think one country is like shoe polish, which uh -huh. you never push, and then all of a sudden the so, what about for the workers, the company? I think not so much. I think if the workers didn't enjoy it, yeah. they would essentially just ignore it and not try and put the product. Whereas those that were competitive would try and push the product because for them it's a bit fun of work. You know, if you don't have it, everyone goes on as normal. If you have it, people can actually ignore it or they just uh, go with it. Like, I think it's a good thing. What's your opinion about that? Well, I was in Sumac as well. Then uh -huh. used to get um, people were highlighted for like group performance or whatever. Like I said, they've been, I don't know, gave good service or whatever. They just have their face just like put on the board and stuff. Which you think, yeah, you can understand like highlight the good points. But at the same time, it's like. But they do it every month, so it's harder for it, isn't it? Because they've got to pick one. <laughs> Yeah, but no, like, the thing is, people would, get, and people would get this perception of what that person's like. You know, like, that's nice the good thing that you do always. So, you know, how, how like. did they measure that? Oh, well, I guess they just had, like, I think the, the, the managers of each department used to put, used to just, like, notice things, and then whoever got the most notices in that moment. What about the privacy concerns of using these leading tables? Or, you know, yeah. you have the, the picture of yourself in the supermarket, and even if you are a top performer, would you like to have your picture there? Some people would like, I think. I, I don't think like it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't for like customers to see. Yeah. It was just for like the other workers there. But yeah, I know what you mean. Um, do you want your face there? Yes? Um, no, I just wanted to say about the uh, influence on the workers. If yes. If they're being influenced by gamification, um, I disagree with uh, what you said about the. Uh, that if some employees don't want to take part or if they're not as competitive, then mm -hmm. they just don't have to. Because I think peer pressure and yes. situations like these is just way too stressful. And then you get some people who are really driven to a point that everyone else will be obligated to do it as well. So yeah. I think the overall impact is stressful. Yeah, definitely.
uh, it's about the amount of things you do or about the quality of the things you do in the global pace or this pressure is they used to have a similar thing when I worked at Apple, but they like take it to like a ridiculous degree. Like, they actually like walk around with like a like an iPad that's, like, they can take anyone that's on the sales floor and like say how much they're selling and stuff. So they make this whole like, image about it. It's like, but yeah, just tell people they're doing what they want, but like really it's like how many maps have you sold? Oh, okay. like, yeah. And like, I actually ended up quitting because I got like a third of it. Yes, I was giving it for you, but for them it's like so. Well, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's like they, they act like it's like oh, because they we're doing some like these you know when you get like a device and something it's like it's like, it's like it's like your experience. Yeah. But as soon as someone fills with this, it goes like straight back to the person who did it, uh -huh. and like they come and talk to you straight away, and like if you go and meet it, it's just like yeah, it's it's almost like someone they don't trust you to mm -hmm. do what you are supposed to do. Yeah, like watch a movie. Uh, this thing with leading tables about the privacy concerns, about the peer pressure, is about also how you measure how people perform. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about this because you said that people report how good or how bad the service was. Normally, people report when the service is bad. Yeah, exactly. Not when the service is good. Or people um, are not measured because of how good they are, but about how much they do. You know. So it's very sensitive. Area of how you how you develop these rankings. It's also quantity and quality. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sure that there's lots of parts <coughs> of this retail research. Domain, so. Right. So any other experience you want to share? Mm. Uh, I think that some of you have been to industry and have developed programs. Have you had any experience developing gamified? So, and we have the pressure of doing that. No? Yeah, yeah. some stuff in like badges and like, you know, I guess it was like the bolt on type stuff that you Uh huh, yeah. Just kind of, you had like something that already existed and it was just like, yes. well, I mean, increase engagement. So, what was, what was the rationale to do that? I mean, somebody told you, oh, you have to do that because this is too low. Uh, well, I think it was like the, the client yeah. themselves and like, seen it and they were like, oh, this is the cool thing to do. And actually, it was going to work. In the end, it was more like forced than actually. Yes. It didn't make sense. Yes. Did they like it? Did they like Yes. They just thought it was a box. So, you don't know whether it worked or you know. It didn't increase like. Okay. It's not. So, having heard my talk and you know, what do you think? Do you have any. Any position on whether gamification or not only gamification but engagement, phonology or social dynamics <coughs> is good or bad? What do you think? <coughs> Things good. Why? Um, again, it's, it's there's no wrong or right answer. It's just how you implement it. Yes. Uh, in the example of ways, I, I I keep using it uh, because it, I know it, it's very engaging. You enjoy doing the challenges. Yes. You enjoy providing free information to another company. Um, but there are some other examples that I don't think it's very good implementing the way, like Dropbox that you showed. Yes. So it's, yes. You know. Or if you are in charge of controlling a nuclear plant, you have an interface. That's not enough, no. That's the thing, are you, tri you trivialising a task by making it into a game? Yes. I think that's a, a big opinion that I've found for the people is that, you know, why would you want to game something that is so serious? Yes. Is that a good thing? Is it not a good thing? In a nuclear plant, I think that. I don't know. I think I'd probably want somebody to take, it, to take it a little more seriously. Yes. So that's the question. Do we have to gamify, gamify everything? No. no. Any other opinion on good or bad? Good yeah. It's basically like the new, I think you can start applications more like, and pretty much same as what you said. I also think the, how it's actually, I don't even how it's implemented yeah. is quite important. Uh, if you want to gamify something, that's fine if it's appropriate, you've also got to do it well. If it's appropriate, you do it badly, it's not going to work. If it's not appropriate, it's good, it's not going to work. So, as uh, soft features, software engineers, or UXers, that's the key thing appropriateness. And you have to consider the context, the end users that we're going to suffer or have fun with their gamification. So, yeah. what about like longevity as well? Because a lot of games that come out, like on the App Store, for example, they're great for like three weeks and then you just get bored and move on to the game. So if you're trying to make a system that is going to last 
and you're using the same game in essence. So people just going to get bored with it. Very good point. Yeah, it's what happens with technology. I mean, it's in my case, it's very personal and very contextual. But I get bored very easily with these things. I, I, I think I don't like them at all. Especially if the game is hard to, you know, it yes. detracts from the content of what you provide with the game. <coughs> yes, but it's not black or white. It's like you have to be critical about all these things you see in this UX course. Uh, I think there's always you can strike a balance between you know, finding the appropriate way of doing it, the appropriate application, the appropriate people, and that that's a problem that they have uh, that can be solved. I think in the course of the year, like randomizing things and so on. I'm not an expert, on that, but I'm sure that that can be overcome. But that that's definitely a problem of poor configuration. <coughs> I would say. Oh, let's put one you know fun sentence. Good stuff. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so I was saying yeah, that the content is very important um, and the audience. I mean, if you are, I would say that if you are developing a product that will reach broader audiences, maybe it's not a good idea because people have different moods, different profiles, different expectations, different sense of humor. Some are gamers, some are not gamers. Some are gamers but don't like this type of this type of games. Yes. Uh -huh. so, so if you have like you know, so many achievements, so it's like a year and it's only a small app game. Yes. And it's, you know, you just you just you just stop for a bit anyways. But if you make it small and like I think every game just adds a bit on to what you you will you will actually do anyways. Yes. You won't you won't if you put if you put in so much and you feel may have to go lower than that anyways. I know what you mean, yes. Well this this related with this longevity thing and um, the lack of sustainability. Of gamification. I think that it's related to using gamification to draw your attention, to grab yourself to, to the product, to the website, and um, after a while, okay, you're already in. Should I be given gamification stuff? Maybe yes. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Any other view? Determining when it is and isn't appropriate is the difficulty. Yeah. It is obviously a factor. So, would you run user tests to verify whether your gamification is good or not? And if so, with which sort of audience? Well, that's a separate where people are just enjoying the experience anyway, or whether they enjoy it more because of the added gamification elements. Or the novelty of it. Is it a new thing? Yeah. It depends on how like, deeply they sort of yeah. read it. If you can't test it without, like, force for example, it's pretty much like a gamification. Yes. Yeah, you know, so like, you couldn't really separate it and say, I think we need to continue that analysis all the time as well yeah. to make sure that people are on board. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> if you go into your lecture notes, there are some examples, some experiments, some pilot study that Simon learned about how different was an automatic cash machine. A gamified one versus a non-gamified one. Um, they measured the task completion times, and apparently the gamified one took longer, of course, because of more things going on. But when people were asked about which one was better, which was the one that gave a better experience, people chose the gamified, gamified one. Good for thought. It depends also on your audience. So your situation is very important. As I say, I mean, Saturday evening you need fast cash. You don't want to play FIFA games. You want to know. Right. So there's now some other video to contribute to our views on gamification. some
that you guys should meet. Allison has several deadlines piling up on her right now, and honestly, she probably deserves a week off at this point anyway. So today we are joined by a special guest artist. May I introduce Aaron Siegel, substitute pretty pictures maker. Thank you very much for filling in and for giving Allison a well-deserved week off. Alright, let's do this. As promised, we're back to talk about gamification. Gamification may be the most important thing this industry ever does. Not a lot of people are aware of it yet, but in 10 years, I can guarantee you will be. Gamification is simply the idea of taking the principles of play, the things we've learned in three decades of making video games, and using them to make real-world activities more engaging. On paper, that sounds great. It sounds like it could be the key to solving all of our problems with education, to making the workplace more exciting, to getting people to want to re-engage and become socially responsible. But with every great innovation comes the potential for abuse, and this one's no exception. Perhaps we can unleash on the world a way to make everything more compelling and see humanity embrace it for the greatest good. Perhaps we can bring the same ideas that make you play World of Warcraft for 20 hours a week and instead use them to make learning another language or helping to restore a park just as engaging, just as exciting as riding around on a giant boar and holding off a band of marauding elves. Hell, maybe we can figure out a way to combine the two experiences. I don't know. And perhaps in doing so, we'll actually be able to create a better, happier, more contented world for the future. But at the same time, we have to consider the risks, the numerous ways this can go wrong in the face of greed and personal interest. Imagine if racking up debt or consuming specific products were reinforced by the same engagement techniques that keep you playing Facebook games way longer than you probably should. But alright, you get the idea. Let's talk specifics about how this works, both good and bad. The world is facing a really weird crisis right now. A crisis of engagement. Think about the variety of recreational activities we have today. From film and TV to music, video games, theme parks, comic books, even modern major league sports. Now compare all of that to the entertainment options mankind had even just a hundred years ago, and you can see how much more visceral and engaging we've managed to make our leisure. A lot of money and a lot of science have gone into figuring out how to keep ourselves entertained in the last hundred years, resulting in spectacles and entertainment unparalleled in human history. But the rest of life hasn't really kept up. Our education system has barely progressed beyond its 1800s Prussian model roots, and many jobs are no more enjoyable today than they were for our ancient forebears thousands of years ago. Even traditional advertising no longer holds our attention the way it once did, because we've become used to so much engagement per second. Our play is more fun than ever, and it's leaving real life in the dust. We need to fix this problem. If the pattern continues, more and more people are going to be tuning out at school and going through life hating their jobs. This isn't just a concern for basic human dignity. It's a real and pressing concern for society at large. Even with all of today's labor-saving devices, we still see a drop-off in individual workplace efficiency, and engagement in the American education system sure isn't faring any better. If refreshing your Facebook wall is more exciting than school or work, something's wrong. Hence, gamification. At its most basic, gamification simply takes all those Skinner Box techniques we all know so well from earlier episodes, leveling systems, achievements, quests, checklists, rewards, etc., and layers them over existing activities. Scanning barcodes when doing inventory becomes a lot more engaging when there's a progress bar on your barcode scanner showing you how much closer you are to leveling up each time you scan an item. Getting an achievement for going 20 whole days without a customer complaint, or for finishing 30 math problems in a single night, it practically ensures that no one drops the ball on day 18, or quits doing their math at problem 25. It's the exact same thing that pushes us to just finish this level. There have been studies on it. It works. It's proven to increase workplace productivity, facilitate learning, and even make patients take their medicine on time. But this is only the very beginning of how we can gamify our lives. There are a thousand vectors we can use to improve on this simple Skinner Box core. Everything from integrating our school and work experience with the leisure we participate in in our free time, to simple aesthetic things like better contextualizing our work and making sure that the theme or setting is psychologically conducive to the activity itself. Kind of like how when you go to Disney World, everything down to the trash bins near the line for the rides all fit within the setting and don't break you out of that mindset of enjoying the ride. If we can do this, then we can deliver on a vision where we are as excited and energized to engage in our serious lives as much as we are our play lives. There will be less distinction between the two, and perhaps someday there won't be a difference at all. All work will be play, and all play will help enrich our lives. But there's a really nasty potential flip side to this idea, and it's already begun to happen. Companies are beginning to realize that we're no longer caught by traditional advertising the way we once were. We've been so bombarded by media that we don't even look at billboards anymore. We flip channels through commercials or just fast-forward straight through them. We don't even register banner ads on a web page any longer. So they've turned to new tools to compel us to shape our consumption in a way that's beneficial to them. Look at the rewards on your credit cards. The smarter companies have started having you level up for racking up debt. Check out the progress bar on your frequent flyer program, or the achievements that some of these programs are starting to dole out for taking routes that are more economical for them. Even the McDonald's annual Monopoly game is an example of gamification seeping into marketing. It directs you toward purchasing soft drinks and fries, the two most profitable items for them, by putting the most game pieces per dollar on those items. So, given all that, I don't really want to broadcast my nascent thoughts on how to really take this sort of thing to the next level. However, if any of you guys happen to be educators or doctors, and you're interested in implementing these sort of tactics into your field, our email address is coming right up in the end credits. 
Usually James charges game companies a good bit of money for that kind of consulting, but in your case, he's happy to make an exception. Anything to help make reality a little more fun for everybody. So, yeah, that's about it. Gamification's gonna be big, and it's probably gonna be awesome. Just be wary, because somebody out there is going to try and use it against you. Just keep your eyes open. Thanks again to Aaron for the pretty pictures. See you next time. I think it was a very interesting remark about the involvement of gamification and advertising. Have you ever seen these banners or advertisements with something that could potentially grab your attention? Two plus two, how much is this? Some easy and not challenging thing. So, how much time? Some quick examples. They look like traditional banners that have some hint of, you know, this handle feels like pulling it. Anyway, they're always good, bad sides, evil mess. Right. <coughs> so, what's next? Right, this is one question that Simon poses. Should Simon gamify your Cosmo results to encourage competition? Okay, how would you do that? Which mechanisms would you use? Yes. You'd have to do an opt-in system on it. For example, um, I'm quite a competitive person. I would be happy with it. However, uh, there are people who obviously aren't as competitive as me, so I wouldn't be happy with it. So it'd have to be an opt-in system where, for example, I would Simon would say he wants to do this, and I'd be like, yeah, sure, and then. Like high school volumes stuff like that. Yeah. Achievements. And you could you, you wouldn't necessarily have to lead leaderboard or something. You could do it anonymously, you could say like how your mark compared to like the average of the year or something yeah. like that, and that wouldn't actually give any Yeah, well the you just try to best yourself. Privacy issues of these leading tables. As you say you were anonymized, but you could end up figuring out who's the one at the bottom. <coughs> then it's quite risky. You could almost bet on what you think your mark's going to be, but this is course what you can do. So I think this is atrocious. Yeah. Uh, and then if you, you know, do better than you think, then yeah. that's like a really positive reinforcement. And then if you don't do as well as you thought, that's like, uh, I don't know, you get the chance to have feedback or something like that. That's kind of a game, I guess. Fantasy for the course. Probably, um, like, yeah, I agree with the opt-in, you can really list everyone because the bottom person or the top, the bottom half of I would like though. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it could be I'm quite detrimental. I mean, but do you see any constructive way of gamification I mean, if you provide your coursework and you feel feedback or something like that? Yeah. No, uh, I wouldn't store clubs in the people asked to mark each other's work. I don't know, it's just like, I couldn't bother to mark myself, but it was quite interesting because you were in the, in the position where you're like, well, should I just, like, just mark them incredibly well and hope that they'll do well for me, or should I be like, really stingy? And it was quite weird because um, you didn't know, like, when, when you're just marking one, you don't know how good it compares to everyone yeah. so you don't know where to put the line. Yeah, you need an overall review to do that. Yeah, yeah. and I, I, I heard we did that in another course as well, where you, like, Put like a, a website on, and we had to like rank, we did the audio recording, uh -huh. and we had to like and vote on each other's. And I don't know if it, 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 I mean, I don't know how, how well it actually works in terms of getting like a fair mark because it's quite easy because it's literally game the system and yes. it's just like give everyone a terrible yes. mark and then probably do better. You can yeah. always hack the system. Well, exactly. Yeah. You can treat it like a race. Uh -huh. So, who's the first to submit that crossword? Yeah. They get <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I remember at like A level, um, me and a couple of friends had a game where we'd like try and we'd all fetch each other, like what a ridiculous.
this word if you can get into an essay. And like, you'd have to try and get like some stupid words. Like, one of, and they never, I don't think anyone would pick up on it, but like, you literally could look in the literature for something like totally obscure and then they'd like, come up with a way of putting it in. But stuff like that actually makes you kind of think and, and, and like, actually try and put something together. Whereas like, when it's just you know, submit it first, it's kind of like makes you rush it. I guess it, it, the kind of different mechanics you can use like, have a different net result. And, the quality of what people would submit. Again, it comes down to how to measure things. I mean, it's good to be fast, it's good to be high quality work. I mean, you can always use different metrics to measure. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so again, if you carry out a comprehensive literature review on engagement and you come up with a high number of concepts, uh, To me, many of them mean the same thing. There's some overlap between them. Um, what you will find in your lecture notes is a process of selecting those that we think are most important for you to develop engaging, engaging interfaces. Just context of communication, challenge, life, drive, engage. To me, some of these terms are like very abstract. So, what do you think by drive? What's drive? I just wonder whether it is my <coughs> poor understanding of English or something. Yeah. I, I would say that it, you, when you make the engagement, you want to finish the task. Uh, yes. Drive to finish the task. Yes. So it's something about like the flow also. How you flow somebody into. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to write for once. Enticement for goals. Game learning. Look at this. So there are some terms that repeat time and again across effective use, efficient use, affective use, engagement. So those are the terms that you have to pay more attention to <coughs> because you can maximize. Uh, so you know, if you are interested in the in the topic and you go want to go further, you can find all these references in, in the lecture notes. So in the end, according to this course, this, this lecture, it's all about three terms. It's about being social, it's about progression, it's about play. It's about facilitating, as we talked before, social dynamics, making easy people participate, making easy people to feel a bond towards other participants or towards a product, towards a website, towards a <coughs> Uh, but being sort of subtle, do not create from scratch social network in your, you know, in your video games shop. Sure. There's no need for that. People already use some or established social networks. But this subtle, make sure that people know each other so that it generates a dynamic of group dynamic. By doing social, you can fit your website or your application, like you said, with the maps, with Amazon, eBay. Have you heard the term crowdsourcing? That's very trendy for funding or something like that. There's also some domain in crowdsourcing about working together to do something. So different people join and carry out some tasks online. Yes? There was a music video last year. Um, where the artist asks all of the fans that she released the lyrics to the song and asks the fans to take a picture on Instagram that related to a particular lyric. Yes. And then they sent their, they just like tweeted to the picture or something. And then she collated all of those and that was her music video. That's amazing. So she took all of the fans' pictures and made that into the video. So, so what are the good consequences of doing that? You really engage with your fans, you know, you're acknowledging the fact that they like what you're doing, um, and then you're, you're also rewarding them with their own work, <coughs> in a way. It's true. Yeah, it's yes. pretty true. <laughs> but also, you create a bond between your listeners and yourself, and you can make sure that once you, you develop the final product, 
they will listen to it. Yeah. Not because they like it, mm -hmm. just because they took part in the process of doing it, you know, and they feel part of the thing. So, yes, this is the social dynamics that I wanted to tell you about. Again, progression of playing, all of these uh, video game mechanics, they facilitate engagement. So, what do you have to think about when you want to develop an application that facilitates social dynamics? So, again, we are talking time again about um, collaboration, working together, seeing the outcomes of what we do together. This fosters community, fosters bonding, fosters engagement. Uh, make sure that all the members can interact, but in a subtle way. You do, not, you do not have to make very obvious links between people and so on. It's also talking about some knowledge about language and technology, whether it is playful or whether it can be attached to a certain way. The same with progression. Uh, you facilitate motivation and reward. Is progress socially obtained, not just by individuals, but in groups, like somebody told before about the departments fighting each other, you know, who was more, who performed better. So you don't have to think only about individuals, but in groups of users. Uh, opportunities for friendly competition, reward. You can, you can build processes in the stages. You can put progress bars, you can, you can put stars, you can rate people. So this is the bolt on gamification thing. You can find opportunities to inject gamification things. As long as it is appropriate, you think it's appropriate, it's contextually appropriate. And facility. I think this is like a more a consequence of the previous two dimensions. Like if you make sure that there's social dynamics, if you make sure that it's engaging with play. So make sure that people have fun, that people are challenged, but not too much because maybe they give up. And so remember, maybe it's not the right thing to do. Make sure that we don't have strong evidence telling us that this is the right thing. Some people like it. Maybe they are outliers. Maybe they are specific groups where niche people. So make sure that you are targeting the right people with the right, the right preferences and the education views. Uh, yeah, and remember, last thing this is important. Good is not defined as more than as the dead center of the whatever curve. So, you have to keep in mind this curve. Because it doesn't only apply for gamification, but it applies to many, many things in, in, in user experience and human computer interaction. So, in this case, we have arousal and performance. So, you have low levels of arousal, you don't perform very well. While if you have high levels of arousal, you get stressed, you get anxious and you don't perform at all. So it's always moderate levels of arousal, the ones that propitiate, make sure that you perform well. If you replace arousal by a stimuli, by the number of elements in an interface, by the number of sounds or the number of um, multimodal interactions you have, you can again apply this, this curve. So make sure that it's not too much it's not too little, something in between, so that you can grab the interest of the person and make that interaction close to go ahead. You can see this like, well, a metaphor of this curve is like a website, an empty website with two words, or a website which is endless, you have to scroll down and down. So you have too much information, you get lost, you get confused, you have nothing, you get confused, you also lost. So something in between, think about it. For gamification, do not gamify everything, do not gamify too much. If you do it, do it moderation. Right, so this is the pop quiz for next week. The question you have to keep in mind, and someone will ask what are the pros and cons of gamification. Remember, that there's no proper answer to your opinion. As long as it is well back or well rationalized, no problem. How would you include social good dynamics into your system? How you can enhance the user's perception of fun? What is the skeptic view of gamification? There's no one skeptic view, it's your view. You can be skeptical about it. 
right? If that is the principle, we can just now describe it. So I think this is the things to do next week. Oh, please read your notes. There are some questions at the end of the lecture notes. And next, next week we are going to talk we are going to learn about um, the affective experience. It's all about I told you for um, how art and design get involved into, into interfaces. Uh, the, it's about the emotions, it's about the complexity of the stimuli and so on. So how this has implications on your affective state in your emotions. You will see that and you will see you have a global view of these last weeks. We have the effective uh, elements, the effective ones, the efficient ones, and this the digital one, I think. The icing on top of the, of the cake we've seen today. So any question, ask Simon. is coming on Monday. We will be happy to reply email. Um, that's all. Do you have any question about the lecture today? Right. Thank you. It made me do it at the point, it just ran me and so when they did the first question, they did it for 50,000. I saw the demo for the demo. Between the demo, the question, 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 the